Coming up on this week in computer hardware, Dell, Acer, and Asus announced new laptops, and we want so bad to beat on the new ruggedized Dell tablet, a new best bargain CPU cooler, and a mouse that might last forever. All that more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 430, recorded August 31st, 2017. In order of magnitude better. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TWITCH to save 20% off any order. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, a Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, most delightful, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, most useful news about PC hardware, Mac hardware, mobile internet consoles, and the internet of stuff. This is a family show, so we can't call it the Internet of Other Things. Joining me now, Mr. Family himself, Ryan Shrout. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for thanks for finding a way, connecting in, and finding a way to be on the show this week with us. <laughs> well, you know, someone has to set an example to you and your total lack of connectivity <laughs> when traveling. Uh, my video is probably true. a little fuzzy. I'm down at uh, San Diego at TourCon, so if the door gets kicked open, it's because they think I'm a hacker. Um Exciting news, right? We talked about the 8th generation core Intel processors coming out. We talked about them not exactly being 8th generation if you're in terms of architecture. That Intel says if you make the processors, you can name them whatever delete exploit generation they want to because they are making the processors and they claim they're 40% faster, which if you're using multi-threaded devices should be the truth, not that we can test it until they ship. So, bringing everybody up to speed on 8th core processors, let's talk about some of the announcements. One of our favorites, Quad Core XPS 13, uh, which is going to be available with all of the other 8th generation devices in September of this year. And essentially, it's the ever so delightful Quad Core XPS, or so the XPS 13 that I've been carrying for the last year, but with a Quad Core 8th gen Copy Lake processor, which means uh, things I like to do. Um, like running uh, video rendering tools will suddenly be significantly faster because the number of threads and cores available to them on the processor will be doubled. I like this. Um, I'm also very curious to see what the battery life impact is like, uh, although we are assured battery life will not go down. Yeah, they. if you go to their website, they still uh, quote the same 22 hours of battery life for the 1080p model and 12 hours for the QHD Plus model, which, first mm -hmm. of all, I didn't realize there was that huge of a gap between the two different models of XPS 13. That's that's like a dramatic difference. Even if we know we're never actually going to see 22 mm -hmm. hours out of either one of them, the relative difference between them is is substantial. Um, those 12, 22 and 12 numbers match the performance listed of the dual core Cabby Lake uh, seventh gen Dell XPS 13 machines. So in theory, based on Dell's metrics, there would be no degradation in performance through or degradation in battery life when doing the normal battery life tests, right? If you're going to utilize those threads right. uh, and cores more heavily, you know, depending on your workload, you may see a decrease there, but uh doesn't look like there's any other changes like this is very simply a a processor swap that the design is the same looks like the battery is the same screen resolution options are the same um so so nothing no big changes there although you know I, I, what i'm really curious about is what the pricing may do with this right so intel is mm -hmm. you know they don't they 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 show pricing on their ARC website, which is kind of their specification website, and and the right. pricing on these solutions is only like twenty dollars more than the dual core parts. Um, that being said, the the way Intel is working with OEMs like Dell, HP, Lenovo, these giant these giant entities, what they're probably trying to do is get some of their flagship products out, like the XPS 13, XPS 15 from Dell, the mm -hmm. Spectre from HP, the Lenovo X1 series. Um, they want to get those quad core parts in there like quickly and affordably. So it wouldn't surprise me if 
you, know, you kind of only see these quad core derivatives and these kind of flagship components and you don't like we're not going to see a universal replacement of Kaby Lake dual core core i7 core i5s with quad core Kaby Lake refresh core i7s and core i5s so that'd be my guess at least um yeah, I mean, it doesn't make mis it, it doesn't make sense in a lot of the price performance categories, uh, and most of the people, especially at the low end, uh, aren't going to see a whole huge difference. I think in their everyday use, um, not to drift off, but there. Uh, another one that came out uh, uh, from Dell this week. So we have some other. Uh, you know, we'll talk about this one uh, in a minute or two. We should talk about uh, IFA 2017. Acer announced the passively cooled Switch Seven Black Edition. Mm -hmm. and so this is this also uses the quad core variants. Um, the it's not it's it's less a clamshell notebook and more like a surface uh, design where it's got a kickstand and it's kind of got the uh, fold up keyboard um, behind it. The kickstand is a little bit more interesting and then it has like a hands free uh, uh, engage method where you just kind of you push down on the bottom of the of the tablet. And it the pops open the kickstand behind it. So in theory, you could open it up with one hand. Uh, it's a little bit less cumbersome. The fingerprint reader is actually in the bezel of the tablet itself. So you don't have mm -hmm. like you still get access to it if you don't have the keyboard attached, which is kind of nice. And apparently they have a um, capability where you if you if the machine is off and you do your fingerprint over the fingerprint sensor on the bezel, it will both turn on the machine and unlock it when it boots up. Like it is registering the fingerprint uh, acknowledgement and verification even before you get to the Windows login screen, which is just a nice thing, right? It just speeds things up a little bit. Right. Um, and it, and it kind of gets the process moving a, a little bit easier. Uh, but th the passive cooling on this is is even kind of, it almost seems not possible to me being that you have a 15 watt CPU and this even has a 20 watt uh, discrete GPU, the MX150, GeForce MX150, which is a very low-end discrete GPU, you know, better than integrated graphics, obviously, um, mm -hmm. but not by a huge amount, right? So this, I think it's got 384 CUDA cores, and I don't know what the clock speeds exactly are, but it's using a dual heat pipe system, which they brand as like liquid cool or what do they call it? Uh, liquid loop or something like that. It don't Don't feel like it's anything... Uh, technologically more advanced than we've seen in the past. It is it is heat pipes. It's larger heat pipes and two of them kind of <laughs> connecting through. Uh, but if it can, th the question for me on this is, is there, say you compare it to that Dell XPS 13 with the same quad core 15 watt parts we just talked about, is this right. machine going to be able to run at higher clocks for as long as the Dell system? And my guess would be no. Uh, that there's some kind of, there has to be a sacrifice of some kind moving away from active cooling to a completely passive cooling uh, design right. and still a very thin, compact tablet system. But now keep in mind, like the XPS 13 has, you know, the display is separate from the computing hardware. So there's, you know, there's separation of heat a little bit there. And so, but for mm -hmm. the, for this uh, Acer, the uh, Switch 7 Black Edition, it's all in one place, right? So there's even more heat kind of in this same, in the same physical space. Uh, than there is on the Dell. So I, I'm very curious to get my hands on with it and see if we notice any uh, long-term performance deltas between it and stuff like the Dell or HP or whatever else anybody else puts out. It's still a really nice looking device. Um, right. I, I've never seen one or used one in person, but impressive, impressive design. They look lovely. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the big question is, is you've nailed it is, is, you know, if I fire up, uh, um, you know, if I fire up uh, my favorite video rendering tool, if I, you know, get handbrake going and, you know, handbrake will, will run all of the cords as hard as it can. And that's, you know, it's a little more practical than using, you know, say a, a, a burn-in tool for a processor that maxes out the cores. But um, you'll very, very quickly find out how fast those cores are running and how fast they can run at a sustained full throttle volume. Is it a typical user scenario? Probably not, but it also amazes me that once you get like 30 or 40 tabs in Chrome or goodness help you uh, Firefox, it's always amazing to see how much of your system resources and your CPU go away and your CPU utilization goes up. But um, that's going to be one of the big questions and we'll see just exactly how good um, the design architecture is in terms of uh, pulling away that heat. I mean, the fans on the current 
processors are not that loud, but they are still there. And I, I'm with you. I'll be very, very curious to see uh, see how those work out uh, in the real world. Another uh, product, I really want to test this. Uh, the same time I saw, I had to see a preview of the new XPS 13, which looks exactly like an XPS 13, uh, except it's got more cores. Um, the uh, uh, Latitude 12 rugged tab being shown off. And Reactions to this online to me have been really, really amusing. Uh, I got a link to a Verge article. Dell's new rugged tablet is a key giant that runs Windows 7. I love it. Uh, uh, Jason Kastronakis wrote that one up. One of the other reviews online was like, this is big and slow and stupid and I hate it. And it's it's an interesting thing where you've got a purpose-built device uh, that is built a very specific way for a lot of reasons. And obviously, when you look at that thing, it is a big, giant, ruggedized computer. Yep. Um, you know, it, it, they call it their rugged extreme tablet. It's an 11.6-inch 1080p display. Uh, they can run 6th or 7th generation Intel processors. They're not going to be putting 8th-gen processors in here. 16 gigs of RAM max, uh, up to a terabyte of solid-state storage. Uh, and it can do up to two separate 34-watt-hour batteries. You know, it's running Windows 7, uh, you know, in part because so many of the places that implement devices like these, um, you know, need the option to be able to be compatible with all the existing uh, devices that are out there, all the existing operating system or software out there. Um, and it's fun to look at this because, you know, when people talk about moving to like, oh, we've got to move to a new laptop in the expensive pain uh, in an office environment, but if you have like, you know, 300 delivery vans or 50 police cars or a bunch of fire trucks or some combination of all of those things, um, then you have to think about like, if I change form factors, do I have to buy new mounts for everything? Do I have to rewire, yep. uh, everything? Do I have to? So, you know, looking at stuff like this, um, you know, keeping things compatible over time, um, it's like 2.82 pounds, which sounds outrageous, uh, which is funny to say. Um, you know, for a tablet, it sounds outrageous, um, um, but uh, you know, that's like three quarters of a pound lighter than the previous one. Uh, should be fairly more power. Costs about $1,900. Um, they have the option of a rugged dock, rugged keyboard cover, a battery charger, just all sorts of you know burly stuff. Uh, I'll be curious to see what the performance looks like. Um, hopefully, we're going to get one in uh, on tech things. I, I just want to do a video with doing horrible things to it, and then holding it up and seeing if it's still running or if it broke yet. Um, but you know, construction looks flawless. It looks like a really, really nice setup. Uh, and I like rugged devices because they're fun. <laughs> yeah, look fire um, it's true you know i i, I attended a dell rugged uh, event in austin last year where we were you know not just allowed to but asked to like take them and throw them and we were on jet skis on lake travis with them and uh throwing them off the edge of the boat onto the onto the shore on the rocky shore uh and it's impressive what they can do i took i took one to uh on a beach vacation where i let emmeline like basically bury it in the sand and dig and play around with it and then I was still able to take it back upstairs and turn it on and use it. It's it's a very they're very unique devices. Um, I have we actually have a Panasonic Toughbook here in the office too that we're kind of messing around with to do to do a story around. Uh, and it is it's not for general consumers. And if general consumers see it, you're right. They're right. they're uh, you know their the reactions to it are going to be predictably bad. Um, I like the know, idea I, I that think oh, some they have one that runs it. Windows Seven. Super important for a lot of for a lot of audiences, right? Well, you know, it, I think it comes with Windows 10. You downgrade to Windows 7, but uh, you know, I think also some people are going to look at it and be like, "Yeah, that's going to go with my truck." And, <laughs> you know, running a 1995 yeah. Dodge 2500 with a big old diesel inside of it, it really would blend well with my truck. And uh, although I will say, you know, however many. Uh, phone screens I've trashed in the last uh, several years of my life. I still haven't managed. I, you know, I'm not going to say that out loud. I'm going to knock on the wood uh, <laughs> mirror up here, lest I find myself replacing a laptop screen uh, before I make it out of San Diego. FSP Window 4 and 6 CPU air cooler. Sebastian wrote this one up. We haven't seen a new air cooler in a while. Uh, I see copper tubes. I see black tubes, which aren't nearly as cool as tubes that would change color with your LED lighting, but it does give you an option for inside of the case. Uh, 120 millimeter extreme quiet fan enhances uh, cooling performance, high-tech 120 millimeter fin design. I mean, it looks like every other 
120 millimeter fan. Not to take anything away from FSP. Um, to, uh, what I love the fact that it's priced at twenty nine ninety nine, and that puts it right in the face of Cooler Master's Hyper Two One Two Evo. So the question is, uh, can the can the Evo, or I should say, can the Windale Four beat the Hyper Two Twelve Evo uh, as the bargain of choice? I should also point out, by the way, the aluminum version with black plating does include a blue LED. It is forty four ninety nine. The Windale Four, which does not include uh, the blue LED and has uh, two fewer heat pipes, um, is twenty nine. Nine dollars and ninety nine cents. What uh, what was the performance like on these? Performance on them was actually pretty good. If you look at the second page, uh, yeah, that graph right there. Sebastian did testing, and, and the Windale Six obviously performs a little bit better than the Windale Four. Bigger, more heat pipes, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of sandwiches the Hyper Two Twelve Evo, but it's really, really close. Uh, under stress load, you can see, uh, you know, the the delta temp of the Cooler Master Hyper Two Twelve Evo was fifty four point three degrees Celsius. Whereas the Windale 4 was 54.3 and the Windale 6 was 52.9. What's more important, so so let's say performance is close. It's within reason. Right. Uh, but if you look at the second graph that looks at noise levels, there's a dramatic difference where the FSP, Windale 4, and 6 are both um, quieter under load than the Hyper 212 Evo is at idle state. Right. So wow. if, if, if we had one complaint about the Hyper 212 Evos, it is that they are a little bit louder. Um Mm -hmm. In most of our environments where we use it, that's not really a big deal. It's not a case or whatever. But if you if you're if you're comparing twenty five to thirty dollar coolers, uh, now you start to look at okay, performance is is pretty much a wash. What are the other differentiating factors? And right. FSPs either you know their sleeve bearing fan or or something about the cooler design is, is allowing it to be more efficient and thus run uh, quieter at the same at the same at essentially the same temperature levels. Um, looks like. We looked at this last night. The actual, actually, the uh, the Windale Four is twenty four ninety nine on Amazon currently, uh, but the six heat pipe nice. version is out of stock. So, uh, don't know what the actual uh, pricing is on that. But twenty four ninety nine for I, the for the Windale Four is is seems like a really good deal for somebody looking for a cooler. A fantastic deal. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have Evo is like twenty nine now. Yeah. It's certainly, you know, there's certainly a, a measurable difference between the Windale 4 and Windale 6 uh, in terms of, you know, idle load uh, and stress uh, tests on a Core i7-7700K. It was interesting to me is that how tiny the deltas are. You're looking at like 1.4 degrees uh, under a full load, you know, degree and a half or so, uh, you know, at a normal load. Um you know, uh, it, less than two degrees, I think, in almost all deltas. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's interesting because, oh, wow, so those extra heat pipes uh, and the LED don't do a lot for cooling. Um, but I got to say, uh, not that 47.4 decibels is is really loud, um, but you're looking at, you know, eight, not, almost nine degrees or excuse me, nine decibels quieter for the FSP Windell 4. That's a huge delta. Um, in terms of, of audio levels. And for 25 bucks, I think mm -hmm. it makes it a fantastic deal, um, which is probably why it got a PC per gold award, ladies and gentlemen. Yay, more inexpensive heat sinks. That makes me happy. And hey, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Tracker. There's a ritual to looking for your keys. You check the obvious places, the couch, the kitchen, the pockets. In my house, the kids did a thing once where they stuffed them under the dog bed. I think they didn't want me to go to work, but you get the idea. Things get lost for weird reasons, and you can spend your whole day running around the house, but we got a better idea for you, the Tracker. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device, and now they've done it again with the new Tracker Pixel. It is really awesome. You never worry about losing your things again. Tracker Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. Just place the Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose, your keys, your wallets, your cat, oh, to be able to find the cat. At. Think about it. It's small enough to fit on your smallest items without being a drag. And it's easy. When you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, you use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will howl out to help you find it in seconds. It even has powerful LED lights so you can find your items in the dark. Lose your phone? This is awesome. Just press the button on your tracker pixel. You can put one on your key ring and your phone rings even if it's on silent. 
You can even locate your items if they're miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. And as soon as somebody walks by your gear, you'll get an update about where it is. Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee is awesome. You truly have nothing to lose. You should go to the tracker.com and enter the promo code TWITCH to save 20% off any order. That's T H E T R A C K R dot com, promo code T W I C H, TWITCH for 20% off. Isn't it time you stop losing things? Oh my goodness. They're tiny. It's good stuff. AMD Radeon RX Vega 56. Uh, is it an upgrade from the AMD? The R9 Fury and the crew at Hard OCP did what the crew at Hard OCP does. They got the benchmarking tools out. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to their full evaluation uh, of the Radeon RX Vega 56 video card, um, which uh, was a delightful surprise. At $399, it takes over for the GTX 1070 as the best card value at $399, which is great because I just bought a 1070. So it's good to know I could have waited and gotten more power. Not that I'm bitter, <laughs> but uh, their question was taking a look at it like, you know, do you have a Radeon R9 Fury? So they picked up an Ace Strix Radeon R9 Fury video card, uh, which started at $579. Uh, and uh, is, is that card two years old now, Ryan? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, I think it is. Or very close. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the testing. I think uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% in terms of performance boost. Um, and uh, that's pretty freaking awesome. You know, if you want to buy a new card. <laughs> right. What's interesting to think about uh, is, it is, so it's the same number of cores, same number. It's like essentially right. the same compute unit breakdown between these two cards. The difference is really in the clock speed. The uh, the boost clock is rated at 1471 megahertz on the Vega 56, and it's rated at 1000 megahertz on the Fury R9 or the R9 Fury. Uh, so that's at, you know obviously that's a you can do the math pretty easy on this. That's a 47 percent difference in clock speed, but we're not getting 47 percent more performance because the boost clock is you know in general the the clock's going to be while you're gaming a little bit below that. Um, so that's interesting to look at, and actually you get a little bit less memory bandwidth. As well, you're going from 512 gigabytes per second on the previous generation card to 410 gigabytes per second on the new generation of card, but you're saving it's at lower power draw and, and all that type of stuff. So I think 25 to 30 percent is probably pretty much what we expected going into that. So um, you're, you'll definitely see uh, a performance improvement with that if you can find one of those cards in stock, I guess. So keep that in mind. Interesting. Too. Oh my goodness. The. Uh yeah, it's exciting. I mean, you know, you're looking at, yeah, I guess 35%, 1440 gaming. It's super, super solid on, which is something they didn't feel about the Radeon uh, R9 Fury. So uh, it's good. And it's much cheaper than the R9 Fury was um, back when it launched, which is a big plus. Oh, my goodness. the uh, I'm uh, having a moment where my tab won't open on the browser. Um you put a story in from Scott. Uh, new GPU launch, new attempt to unlock stuff. I'm afraid so we, of what you're trying to unlock here. I am at a we, hacker well, conference had, right now. so <laughs> Yeah, nothing that severe. We we had talked last week, I think, about um, you know the availability issues of Vega. And one of the other complaints is people weren't able to do BIOS mods, uh, which, one is, which was one of the things that AMD, Radeon, you know, a certain segment of those users really, really loved to do. Um, well, as it turns out, while you can't modify a BIOS because it's signed, you can actually take a Vega 64 BIOS and flash it onto a Vega 56 card, which is not unlocking your shader count, uh, your core, your stream processor count, but is, is moving you up to higher clock speeds, uh, a higher uh, thermal levels or uh, wattage power draw levels and thus improving your performance. And based on, this was all posted uh, off from a um, a forum post over at Chip Hell, which is a uh, very long-standing, well-known Chinese, you know, computer tech enthusiast forum. Uh, 
the modified Vega 56 with the with the Vega 64 BIOS scores within two or three percent of a Vega 64 just out of the box by just doing that flashing, right? So without any extra tweaking or mm -hmm. overclocking. Which is actually interesting because in theory, what it's doing is it's actually getting higher clocks than uh, the Vega 64 natively does because it has fewer shader units running and, and maybe it's getting a little bit more thermal headroom out of it because of that. Um, so it's cool that you can do that because you're basically taking a signed BIOS and putting it you know, still on a, on a card uh, that is in the same family. So there doesn't appear to be any issues mm -hmm. with it. We haven't done any of that in-house yet. We have one Vega 56. They're really hard to find. I don't really want to try to, to screw it up or kill it yet. Um, but what this does mean likely is that finding a, uh, a Radeon RX Vega 56 is going to be even more difficult as people realize that you can do this, uh, you know, spending $100 less for a video card and then just simply flashing it over to run at almost identical performance levels is, is, is an easy kind of win-win situation for that. Right. But Nothing. yeah, now I, now the race begins to see if you can do any any kind of actual BIOS modification to stuff uh, to maybe tweak things a little bit further. Huh. The uh, oh my goodness, it was funny. A story that popped up this morning to kind of turn directions in in a different way, uh, but still saving money. There's my my segue thread. Uh, Nest finally came out with a new thermostat with a new design. Um, the Nest Thermostat E. Um, we haven't had, it's kind of funny, we, we haven't done a whole lot of Internet of Stuff lately uh, other than uh, uh, other than the home automation devices, um, you know, the Google Home and, and stuff of that. But um, yeah, it was curious for me because this was such a, a, a huge uh, player uh, in part because there were several automated thermostats or, or, or intelligent thermostats out at that point. Ecobee had been out for a while at that point. But the Nest uh, built so much on its design and appeal uh, to homeowners and techies. Um, but this is the first new one, uh, really radically new design. I mean, they, they tweaked the design some, but this is the first kind of rethinking of what it looks like um, since 2011. Um, so the Nest has been on sale uh, for $249 and, and will remain on sale, or, or is now again on sale for $249. Um, but this new model is going to sell for $169. And you notice um, it's got a kind of a white puck instead of stainless steel. Instead of a bright black screen, it's got frosted glass with a relatively uh, not too bright um, screen on it. Although it's it's interesting, like it doesn't do the thing. It's not going to do the thing that the 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 more expensive model does, where if it thinks you're across the room, it brightens up the display um, to show you the temperature. But it's supposed to control something like 85% of the thermal systems in the house or, you know, HVAC systems in home. Uh, the full Nest thermostat still promises like 95%. Um, but the big deal here is is the price is going to be $169. I, I got to say, having been wandering around a bunch of, at Best Buys lately and looking at the displays, um, I think they had to finally cut the price because there are so many competitors out there. Uh, especially when I, I look at some of the, the latest generation Ecobee stuff where they seem to be doing a lot more for the money you're spending. Um, but it's kind of curious. I'm also curious to see how Nest does because, you know, one of the things we've read is that internally uh, there were so many battles at Google uh, over home automation and the direction it was going to take and that Nest would become a less uh, important project. But, um, you know, Nest is still going. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what else to say, but, uh, uh, as somebody who's been running a, a Nest thermometer for probably five years, um, the, uh, same here, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, and, and, and I've, I, you know, somebody asked me if I would buy it again and I was like, I'll be honest with you, you know, when the thermometer, the smart smart thermometer is in the room with my wife and my children and decides nobody's home and turns the heat down to 50 degrees on a 38 degree winter day. I can't say that I'm super impressed, um, you know, with the intelligent thermometer, but you know, I've also used a couple other thermometers, uh, since then rotated them in and then rotated them back out. And there's a lot of things it does really, really well. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's curious. Uh, I'm curious to see, you know, what comes out next and, and some of the new developments, because it seems like in the wake of, of you know, Alexa uh, and Google Home, and of course, uh, Apple's trying very, very hard to make HomePod more relevant. 
and, and there's a couple open source efforts that some of the home automation stuff I've been leaning towards, but not ready to, you know, sell my soul for, uh, <laughs> might actually be uh, practical or at least a little bit more functional. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be curious to launch. Um, the other thing that, that came up recently while we're talking about the, the home full of stuff, the internet of stuff was that, uh, Sonos has a new agreement, uh, and a new privacy agreement, uh, based on their efforts to make Sonos compatible with stuff like Amazon's, uh, echo. Um, and it'll be curious to see what happens with that because, um, Plex decided they were going to start collecting user data, and the outcry was so profound in the forums, they decided they probably weren't going to do that after all. And it looks like Sonos has suggested that if you don't accept their new uh, uh, user uh, privacy policy, um, that eventually you will start to sort of lose features or lose updates for your system. So, uh, I've been, again, I've been uh, uh, traveling a little bit, and I have been on on top of that, but, you know, it... it it begs the question, you know, if your hardware, your expensive hardware in your house is relying on offsite services to do the thing it does, uh, and you suddenly have to give up more privacy than you want to, um, you know, what does that mean for you? And in most cases, it means your SOL. Uh, you know, you have a choice between giving up that information to the company that probably wants to resell it or at the very least aggregate it and use it um, or giving up on that hardware. And it's something to think about, especially as you're looking at more expensive stuff, bringing it into your home or, or adding it to your home systems is whether or not it's going to share or track information that you don't necessarily want shared or tracked. But something to think about, um, you know, as you're looking at yeah. some of the more expensive purposes, purchases, because so much of this stuff is profoundly expensive. Like I would love to have automated window blinds, you know, but I'm also not going to spend the thousands of dollars it would take to even equip our yes. modestly sized home, <laughs> you know, our, our little 1200 yep. square foot, you know, working class cottage. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I just wanted to lay that out there. It's something I've been thinking about a lot, a lot in the last week. And also again, being at a hacker conference, realizing, uh, once again, that the internet of stuff just, is one giant joyful attack vector uh, waiting to be exploited. So, sorry, didn't mean to get into the uh, the internet minute or the internet the the, the home automation minute, but uh, I did. So I'm sorry. Coolant CPU 390 CI CPU Waterblock review. This thing is pretty. Um, I mean, I think on some level all water blocks are pretty, but this one for some reason I just find especially delightful. Um, you know, possibly because it looks so extremely well polished on the part that goes down in your your processor. Um, you know, really nice configuration. Uh, uh, more did the write up uh, on PC Per, but I love the fact that they've got pretty much everything you need, including the tools uh, and the heat sink, the thermal compound. Um, yep. Having had to make a run to a, a local computer store a few weeks ago to help somebody out because there wasn't thermal compound in the box with the device they were getting. But uh, oh, no. LGA 211, LGA 1150, 1151, 1155, 1156, 1366, quote, may require BLT CPA SCD12 for fixed motherboard backplates uh, and socket LGA 77. AM4, AM2, AM2+, AM3, AM3+, FM1, FM2, FM2+, which is basically saying it's going to support almost anything you're likely to want to attach this to. Um, how yeah, did it fare? The Threadripper, so still right. trying to see what that is. It's not, it's not big enough to do a full coverage of Threadripper, but it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. fairly, fairly close. You can uh, cover most of Threadripper. Wise, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's scary we have to have that conversation, but it's there. Um, so yeah, if you look at the performance uh, page on this, you'll see Maury's results, and it, it does pretty well, right? They have he he tested in two different orientations, you know, rotated ninety degrees, essentially the alt orientation. Um, right. He's giving you delta temperatures, and it's you know in line with uh, the previous Coolant CPU three eighty i, although the build material is a little bit better on the new one, so that that gives you advantage. And then he compares right. it to three other water blocks that he's looked at recently: the EK Supremacy MX. Uh, the Alpha Cool and an XPS Raystorm Pro, uh, and it does very well. It's actually, let's see, even yeah. an OC, it's about the best performer we have seen thus far. Now you're talking about differences of one to three degrees Celsius, so not huge changes. Right. Uh, but if you're the kind of guy who is building these and you actually want performance out of it, that's maybe gonna 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 tip your tip your hand a little bit in that regard. It is a nice eighty to ninety dollars uh, for the water block. 
uh, depending on where you buy it. Amazon had it for seventy eight forty five at the time of of uh, publication. Uh, now it's up to ninety nine dollars, mm-hmm. so that's worth noting as well. Um, and we're also uh, pointing out this is range. this is not a sealed or pre configured water cooling system. You are going to need to you are going to need a pump and a radiator and plumbing yeah. and coolant of some kind. So you know, for a hundred bucks, you know, a hundred bucks will buy you a complete system. Um, for most of the stuff we looked at, a complete liquid cooling system that's ready to go. This is going to be integrated into your existing water cooling system, or you're going to be building a water cooling system from scratch, which means spending a whole bunch yep. more money. Um, because pumps that are quiet that you're okay to put inside of your PC generally aren't the least expensive things uh, you might put inside of your PC. So. Correct. Oh, my goodness. Uh, be quiet. SFXL 600-watt power supply. Um, Lee did this one up, and I was kind of curious. Uh, you know, with be quiet on the front, are they claiming this is a quieter power supply? Compact and silent energy is a big boast to see on the front of a box. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what the Be Quiet brand was really founded on, right? Was the desire to have right. lower noise levels. Um, they're, they're still, um, like, that, that's still a focus, but they're they're clearly branching out into just trying to create general purpose things. So this is an F- right. SFXL, which is the small form factor, but a little bit longer uh, version of the form factor there. Um I'm trying to look. So here we go to the noise temperature value. Uh, Lee does say that the 600 watt power supply starts out virtually silent, stays very quiet throughout the mid power range at full load with an elevated ambient temperature. The cooling fan did speed up and the noise became noticeable, but never really loud. So it's, it it is quiet, but it maybe is not, it's not silent, right? So um, that being said, it, it performs admirably. It did uh, very well in his uh, energy and efficiency, DC load regulation, and AC ripple test. I think it got a gold award at the end of this. Um, no, silver award. But the only weakness really being that it had a, a moderately uh, sized three-year warranty. As I think many of the power supplies now are going to five, seven, eight, ten-year power supplies all dependent. So, um, you know, everybody's a little bit different on there, but this is this is a SFX, so it's meant for chassis that are specifically calling for an SFX or an SFXL power supply. Uh, they can be adapted to full size ATX chassis, but you're kind of shoehorning it in at that point. So unless you have a specific need for this, or you get one of these at a discounted price, um, that's that seems like a little bit of overkill because these are more expensive. Than you might expect. It's $120 for the 600 watt variant and $99 for the Whoa. 500 watt variant. Um, you're paying for the compactness uh, uh, of the design, right? I mean, if you look at the back there, where all the it's a completely um, uh, uh, it's a completely uh, non non attached cable. I don't know why I'm blanking on the term uh, modular. There you go, completely modular power supply. Uh, <laughs> But there's not a whole lot of room for any more connectors on that. So you get a sense of, of what the SFX design actually does, those types of things. So, hmm. yep. An option, but not a spectacular one. Silver Ward from PC Per, um, which is passing, but not impressive. Which is kind of harsh to say out loud, but I think it's fair. Uh, G16 or G613 or G613 wireless keyboard, G603 wireless mouse. Um, the beginning of a parade of new peripheral devices. I think Logitech's ramping up for the holiday season early by getting a bunch of stuff out, especially for gamers uh, on the show floor, uh, on the yep. show floor, on <laughs> into the stores and the channels. Um, the big thing about this is Logitech's Hero Sensor, their high efficiency rating optical. And boy, that just sounds like a bit of a forced acronym there. Um, you know, what they're going for is Logitech G900 performance uh, that was brought by the PMW 3366 sensor, but quote offers 10 times the power efficiency, allowing for incredibly long battery life. Everything from the lens design to the pixel surface area to the analog to digital conversion on the controller has been tweaked to improve performance efficiency, which is probably like saying, boy, people love this wireless mouse, uh, but boy, it used to chew through batteries a lot. Um, Some interesting stuff going on there, Uh, you know, and, I, I dare say, as expensive as it sounds, as a a, a lifetime Microsoft mouse user, uh, and I don't think I've ever paid more than twenty bucks for one. So I always, you know, I would see a bucket of them for sale for fifteen bucks in OEM wrappers and pick up three or four. Um, 
this is uh, you know this is costing seventy bucks. It doesn't look like somebody was copying design cues from bad science fiction uh, and ignoring any or right. all ergonometrics because so many gaming mice now they look like little spaceships, which is great if you like to hold angular things with pointy edges um, and easy to break plastic bits. Um, not my jam, but certainly an option there. Um, but they're claiming 18 months of battery life with gaming usage. Yep. That's crazy. So the, <coughs> the, the mouse is claimed, so it has two modes. It has uh -huh. a high mode and a low mode. So it's uh, low, lower, high performance mode, I think, which is a one millisecond response time and the low, right. uh, low performance mode, which is eight millisecond response time. So, it's get, it, they're rated at 18 months at the low response time setting, uh, at low performance, sorry, low performance setting. At the high performance, it's estimating four to six months. So there's a difference there. And it does run off standard AA batteries. It's not a like USB rechargeable device. Um, I think for the most part, I've been using this for just a couple of days now. I, I haven't noticed any issues running in the low performance mode, but for people who are hardcore gamers, they're going to run in the high performance mode. I still sure. think four to six months of battery life off of a pair of AA batteries is actually pretty impressive. Uh, and actually, you can run it that off just reasonable. a single AA battery if you want to adjust for weight mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, you're just going to get half half the rated battery life. Um, I love the, there, the there, fact there, that you pointed out. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I say I love that. You know, the thing you point out right is with your G900, you typically get 24 to 36 hours of gaming. Yeah. Versus, you know, in high mode or the battery sucking down a lot mode for the G603, you're looking at 500 hours of that's, right. that's like well over an order of magnitude and improvements. That's that's huge. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, and it also like the mouse has other features like it can be connected to both a uh light speed device and a Bluetooth device, and you can switch between systems with the button on the bottom of the mouse that way. Um, I, I think the, the design, it's not an ambidextrous design. It's, it's definitely one meant for right-handed users, but uh, pretty simplistic, uh, very IntelliMouse-ish by the look <laughs> and feel of it. Um, and then the other thing they announced was the G13 keyboard, which is a wireless mechanical gaming keyboard. Um, right. So this is also battery powered. It is rated at 18 months of battery life on two AA batteries. There's no high performance or low performance modes on this particular one. The caveat is, is they had to get they got rid of RGB or LED backlight. So there is no LED light on the backlight of these keys. The only lights that exist are your caps lock mm -hmm. key, uh, a battery indicator. And the lights under the buttons let you switch between um, the wireless and the Bluetooth uh, connection type. Now, it uses Romer G switches, so it's not a cherry switch. So it's the same thing that's in like the G810 or the G910 keyboards, right. which I've been they're, using they're, for a while. I actually like them. They're not bad switches. I mean, at this point, there are, you know, there's cherry, there's two or three sort of third-party alternatives, and there's a whole bunch of keyboard manufacturers that have decided to make their own switches. And most of the switches are probably made in the same factories as the third-party manufacturers and seem to be performing really, really well over time. Because between the two of us, I think we've got, you know, I've I've got hundreds of hours of typing on one of Corsair's keyboards. Um, there's lots of options out there uh, yeah. that, that seem to be holding up as well as the Cherry keyboards. I should point out, I will be reviewing a mechanical switch that claims to be silent next week. I just want to lay that out there. <laughs> interesting, interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, this this keyboard uh, also has the ability. So at the top of it, there's a button to switch between a Bluetooth and a uh, the the wireless. So you, if you want to connect this to your PC through Bluetooth, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Although it's not recommended for for gaming purposes, just because of the added input latency that 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 drives. What they what they pitch it for is actually uh, you attach it to your computer through the light speed wireless you know technology through the dongle that they include in the in the in the box. And then you connect it to Bluetooth to your tablet or your phone, and they actually ship a like a little plastic dock that your phone stands up in on your desk, right? Or your uh -huh. tablet stands up in on your desk. It's just freestanding. It's not attached to the keyboard or anything like that. And what I've been using it for, and this is what they pitch it as, is you get a text message on your phone, you unlock it, 
it goes to the thing, you you hit a button, and within you know less than a second, it has switched over to Bluetooth mode. It's always paired with your phone, and now you can you know use your keyboard to type the text message, hit enter, send, hit the button, go immediately back into the Windows environment, and start typing it there. And being able to switch between those two devices is pretty neat. Um, it's not you know not everybody needs that, uh, but if you've ever uh, you know if you're at your desk and you're responding to text messages from your wife or your friends, uh, and then on your computer. You know, you're you're writing emails, you're doing other stuff. Like being able to to use a keyboard for both of that is is a nice little bonus a bonus feature. Yeah. But um, so far, I like the keyboard. You've... I will I will say that the 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 paint the uh, uh, the labeling on the keys is it, this this may just be a result of the fact that I'm used to seeing semi translucent labeling because of RGB and uh, LED backlighting. But it's there's a strong contrast. This is a very bright white paint on the keys. I think in their in their mind to make up for the lack of backlighting, right? So hmm. um, trying to make it as visible as possible in dimly lit environments, if you happen to need that. But the option is stuff. there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Full review of that coming up uh, in a couple of weeks, I would imagine. Or yeah, or yeah, hopefully less. But yes, coming up soon. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, if uh, you are looking for more of Mr. Ryan Shroud, the best place to find his work, Alan Malventano, and the rest of the PC Per crew is at, ladies and gentlemen, PCPer.com. I'm Patrick Norton. You can find me at AV Excel. It's the podcast I host with Robert Heron. We talk a lot about home theaters, TVs, and of course, speakers and audio and headphones because we love that stuff. Home entertainment makes us happy. And you can find me, of course, with Shannon hosting Tech Thing each and every week at techthing.com. We want to thank you for joining us on the adventure that is this week in computer hardware. If you'd like more of our older shows or you're subscribing for the first time, please go to twit.tv slash twitch. And you'll get all of the information and copies of all of the older shows. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening or watching however you consume the show. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schramm. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.